Okay, so in this our third podcast of the year, we are going to be covering a fair amount of material, starting with that little bitty bottom part of page three. Most of the definitions are already written for you, and a lot of this should seem a little familiar, so we're going to go through, talk about it, make sure you understand some of the differences between some key terms, and just mostly write down some examples. So let's get started. First off, Chemistry is the study of matter and the changes that it undergoes, as you already see written there on your paper. So we're going to be studying matter a lot this year. Well, what is matter? Well, matter is anything that has mass and takes up space. So that's our fundamental definition of the stuff we're going to be studying. And we'll talk a lot more about this in class, but one of the things I'm going to bring up when I do talk about this with you is, is air matter? Can we prove that? Also, is there anything that's not matter? Is there anything that doesn't have mass and or take up space? So those are going to be some kind of jumping off points that we can talk about next class. And if you're thinking about answering those, kind of getting prepared for next class, you probably need to know, well, what exactly is mass? And you see that definition kind of waiting to be written there. Uh, We've already written weight for you. A lot of times these words get confused, but they're not the same. Mass is a measure of how much matter is in an object. It's almost like matter is something that has mass and takes up space. They kind of define each other, which means this has to do with the physical content inside an object, like the fact that there's a hundred trillion atoms in every human cell. It talks about how much stuff there is inside a certain amount of space. Weight, on the other hand, is all about the gravitational force exerted on an object. So when you go to a different planet, your weight will change, but your mass will not. Every single atom of you is still there. It's just, you know, not held as tightly to a different planet if it has lower gravity. So mass is also going to be important when we start doing chemical reactions because it always follows this law of conservation of mass, which tells us that mass is neither created nor destroyed in a chemical reaction. We're going to be doing lots of these this year. And what that really means when it comes down to it is that it's the exact same atoms before and after that reaction happens. They've just moved around in a different order. And we will study, we have a whole unit on chemical reactions in Unit 7, but for context, if you imagine that A and B, C and D are each their own element, then we could have a compound like AB react with CD and form two completely new compounds, AD and CB. Those weren't there before, but notice how every single letter is still there, it's just with a new buddy. They've switched and rearranged themselves. So let's talk about some physical and chemical changes. The definitions are written for you there at the top of page four. So our physical changes only alter the physical appearance, the outside appearance. They don't change what the substance is, while a chemical change involves creating new substances, like what we saw in that chemical reaction example on the previous page. So it's all about finding that new substance. But if we can't see a chemical reaction like what I had written out before, if we can't see those different elements changing, then we have to look for something else. So off to the side, what I want you to write down in this area is actually the indicators of a chemical change. These are the things that we're going to be looking for that can prove to us that a chemical change has occurred, even if we can't see those elements separating and rearranging themselves. So, first thing to look for in a classic chemical change is bubbles or gas being made. These have to be surprise bubbles. This isn't just like you blowing bubbles in your water or your milk with a straw. These are new gases being created. So if we see those new surprise bubbles, then that could be a chemical change. Similarly, if we see a new surprise solid, also known as a precipitate, that is an indicator that a chemical change has happened. Also, some kind of heat or light released is an example, a predictor, an indicator that a chemical change has happened that shows us that the energy of our chemicals has changed. And also if there is a color change, and once again, a surprise color change, not taking a blue marker to a white piece of paper and saying, look, the white paper turned blue. 
and is like adding blue food coloring to a clear liquid and all of a sudden it turns red or pink or green. That would be a surprise and that would indicate some kind of chemical change has happened. So if we look at a few examples down here, ask yourself, do I see any of those indicators of a chemical change? If so, then it was a chemical change. If not, then it's physical, like breaking a pencil. It's still all the same chemicals there, none of those four indicators. That's just a physical change. Frying an egg does change color as well as form a solid. Leaves turning color in the fall, well, that is one of the very definitions of a chemical change, and then one of those indicators, changing color. So you go ahead and think about these other three. I'm not gonna judge you based on your correctness, but I do wanna see that you've tried, and we can talk about these when you get into class if you're uncertain about them. Now, let's talk about those solids, liquids, and gases because they were kind of built into those indicators of a chemical change. So let's make sure we understand what each of them are. We have some of the formal definitions written down for you here. Um, real quick off to the side, would you put these little letters in parentheses because we often use S, L, and G to represent our solids, liquids, and gases. And they'll be in our chemical reactions in the future just like this. And so with those solids, we say they have definite shape and volume, meaning they cannot change its shape or its volume. And this is because those particles are so close together and they don't have much energy. So they can only vibrate, but they mostly stay put. Our liquids, particles are a little farther apart, have a little more energy, so the particles can flow and move around each other, which lets them change their shape. That's that indefinite shape but they're still held together by some forces that we'll talk about and learn about later. So they do have definite, unchangeable volume. Gases have changeable, indefinite shape and volume because there's no attractive forces between them. So they can separate out even farther than our liquids and move completely far apart. They can escape from the container, in fact. So we're gonna take a quick moment to sketch the, what's called a particle model. So some little simple circles in these boxes that we've given you to help you start kind of visualizing these solids, liquids, and gases on the molecular level. So we're just gonna draw some simple circles and in our solid to show that definite shape and volume, we gotta show these particles really close together in kind of ordered fashion. So I just kind of drew two rows across the bottom our liquid particles start to get a little bit farther apart and start to have some flexible shapes there, so not quite as rigid and straight. And then our gas particles even farther apart and even more taking up the space in their container, even more abstract shapes. Now, at the bottom of that page, we're going to review some of the key words for the phase changes, the changes between our solids, liquids, and gases. Starting from a solid turning into a liquid, that's what we call melting, and the opposite of that when a liquid turns into a solid is freezing. Now there's a lot of words for liquids turning into gases. Boiling is probably the most common. Evaporation or vaporization are also describing the same kind of change, although they are slightly different. If you're curious how they're different, talk to me in class and I can explain the slight differences, but when it comes down to it, any of those words can describe a liquid turning into a gas. And of course the opposite, condensation. Now, those are probably pretty commonly used around in everyday life. These last two are pretty weird, and you probably only use them or see these things happen in a chemistry lab. When a solid turns straight into a gas, it's called sublimation. One place you might have seen that is with dry ice, um, but we will definitely see that in a lab soon. And then the opposite, a gas turning straight into a solid, not going through the liquid phase first, is called deposition. As usual, those two last weirdest ones, the ones you're not as familiar with, are probably the ones that are going to show up most often on tests and quizzes. Now, jump into the top of page five. We're going to talk about these physical and chemical properties, which really, when it comes down to it, are related to our physical and chemical change. Physical properties describe physical changes, so they describe the appearance, the physical appearance. Chemical properties describe how a substance can change into a new substance. So chemical properties describe 
that a chemical change could happen. It's really kind of just the difference in like a verb versus an adjective. The fact that it can do something or that it is doing something. So physical properties of something like melting or boiling point, the temperature at which it melts or boils is a physical property because when something is melting or boiling, it's changing physically. I know it might seem weird that it's changing from a liquid to a gas, and that might seem like a chemical change, but it's still the same substance. It just looks different. Its particles can spread out a little bit more. Same with our color or hardness. You don't have to change the substance in order to test or observe that property. Some chemical properties, on the other hand, flammability. To tell if something's flammable or not, you've got to burn it. That would be a chemical change, and that thus is a chemical property. Toxicity, acidity, things that are talking about what that chemical can do um, or how it can react. So those couple of examples down at the bottom, boiling point, of course, I have in your example list uh, going down reactivity telling how something reacts chemically would be a chemical property toxicity is a chemical property saying how it's going to react or inside your body length if I measured that that'd be a physical uh, change or if, if I changed its length just stretching something physical change so that's a physical property Go ahead and try out these last two once again. Just don't leave them blank. Let me see what you got. We can start by checking those in class if you'd like. And intensive, extensive. These are some new words and they can be a little bit weird, but these are also related to those properties we were discussing. Um, but these kind of tell us how these substances, kind of how reliable these properties are. So intensive properties, as you just saw pop up, do not depend on the amount of matter present, meaning they're independent of amount. Intensive, independent. Meaning if I have more of a substance or less of a substance, that property is still the same. Like color. If I have a red crayon, it's just as red when I have a full crayon as when I break it in half. Breaking the crayon in half did not change the color which means that that color was intensive. Extensive properties, on the other hand, these properties change just when the amount of matter present changes. Not when we change what matter we have, but when I just have more or less of that matter. Something like length. If I break my crayon in half, the length of my crayon has changed when all I did was change how much crayon I have. So when going through these examples, I think it's easy to think of an object um, like a crayon or a glass of water and think about if I add more water to that beaker or pour out some water, will that property change? If it does change, then it's extensive. If it does not change, if it's the same, no matter how much or how little substance you have, then that's intensive. So our boiling point of water is 100 degrees Celsius, no matter how much or how little we've got. So that's intensive. Mass is extensive. If I have more water, it's going to weigh more. Density, on the other hand, is intensive. And we'll talk more about that and learn an equation for it later. But that stays the same no matter what happens to that substance, more or less. Volume, just like mass. If I have more water in this beaker, I'm going to have a greater volume in that beaker. So go ahead and finish these last two. Tell me whether you think they will change when all we do is add more or less water to that beaker. Now, finishing off the page, we're going to talk about the sp specific types of matter. And most of these definitions are already here for you, so we just need to write down pure substance definition is a substance that cannot be separated or broken down by ordinary physical means. And the key word there is actually right at the beginning, a substance. Pure substances are only one substance. And those could be either an element or a compound. Elements are pure substances that can't be broken down chemically in addition to physically. And compounds can are two or more elements that are combined chemically, so they can be separated chemically. 
And if we were to write down a few examples, you'd find all these elements on the periodic table. And I'd encourage you to do some little particle models, kind of like what we drew for our solids, liquids, and gases, just to see that these elements are all one type of atom, only one type of circle in that box, whether they're together or separate. A compound, on the other hand, like CO2, carbon dioxide, or sodium chloride, you can see that we have more than one element together, and in that box, you would show more than one element physically touching each other in that set. But notice how those sets, those compounds, are each one blue circle and one white circle. Inside that box, all of those substances, all of those kind of pairs are identical, which is why it's still pure, even though you have more than one element in that space. Okay, last little bit here. I know we're just past 15 minutes, but we're almost done. Mixture is a combination of two or more substances, and those substances are just mixed physically together, so they retain their own properties. They're not changing chemically because we're not uh, combining them chemically. And we have two different types of mixtures. Heterogeneous is not smoothly blended. It's kind of chunky. You can still see the separate substances that have been mixed together versus a homogeneous mixture that is uniform. It all looks the same. And that means it's been perfectly mixed. It's not kind of separate chunks of stuff. You looks like one thing, even though you know there's more than one thing in it. All right, that's our podcast. I know it was a little bit longer, but we're going to have a couple nights off of having podcasts because of it. Thanks.